my uh, message, I don't really call it a message tonight, is on Father God or Mother Earth. It really came or started from a class I took uh, just recently in my graduate studies on mythology for the modern world. And it brought me to really think and to dialogue with a lot of different people that didn't believe the Bible, that were sometimes antagonistic to the Bible, and had a lot of the rootings in something that was non-biblical. And so it really helped me to, to think through what I believed, to think through the scriptures and what they said, and a lot of different things uh, about uh, even life's existence. So I had a question up there, I'll put up there, it says, myth equals what? When I first thought of mythology and myth, first thing I thought was something that's not true, something that's a lie, something that's just a, a good fable. And that really wasn't the definition that a lot of the scholars and a lot of the class had come up with. A lot of times they would call a myth something that was a good story, a good basis of something that was believed, and a lot of times it was stories that explained a culture's ideology or belief system. As a Christian, you believe the Bible and it had these reasons. As a, uh, a, a, a Greek, you maybe believe some of the Greek culture. Because of the Romans, you believe some of these different stories or these purposes behind it. So it was actually a little bit different. And so um, myth, try to get out of the idea that's something that's not true, uh, at least in their, their thinkings of what it was like. So we'll take a look at some of these answers that they would think, these myths, these stories in their minds, or what are culturally there, as an attempt to answer three important questions, which are actually very important in any person's worldview. As a Christian, we have a biblical worldview that tries to answer these similar questions. Uh, how the world came into being. It's important. We all wonder that. The, the image in God inside of us helps us to think, why is the world the way it is? Uh, why uh, is the world, well, that's the second question, why the world is the way it is? Uh, of course, we think that sin, curse of sin, has caused a lot of problems and pains and suffering in this world that give us a lot of the things that are hard to wrestle through. But these are another question they try to answer. Well, what must be done to maintain existence? Survival of each person, survival of mankind, keeping the world around from, in, in a lot of ways, it may be blowing up or falling apart. So they wrestle through these things. Uh, and I think each of us have some ideas of probably wrestling through a lot of the same questions as we go through and talk about what, what the Bible says. So that leads us to a lot of symbolic purposes, uh, light and darkness. Light and darkness is throughout the scripture a lot of times seen as light is good, uh, godly, darkness is evil. A, a lot of times is the, the way of sin. And, and we use those symbolically in a lot of different myths, stories that we're going to maybe briefly talk about, use certain symbols, certain objects that have a purpose. Uh, or they mean something. They're very symbolic with a purpose behind them. So, uh, also we'll talk about uh, storytelling, myths, telling stories, creating something out there uh, that is maybe fun to listen to, maybe our, our, our kids and our grandkids and many generations have told it, uh, or the way it is. These are pictures actually from cave paintings in France. There's cave paintings throughout the world where people were in caves up at night, however they were doing it, painting on the walls stories so people could actually see and communicate in pictures visually for their kids and their grandkids to be able to see as they're telling these stories. And nowadays we do the same thing, but we you know, pull out our, our phone or put it on our TV or our computer or whatever. As we're telling stories, we like to visualize them. There's different ways we can do that. They did the same thing. Well, it's really storytelling. You see it a lot in our culture. And sometimes you don't even think of storytelling as, as a very generic way. But it could be something as Little Red Riding Hood. It could be something like maybe a, a uh, Cinderella. Disney movie, we probably a lot of us have seen these, some of these Disney movies, Peter Pan, Beauty and the Beast. It's a story. It, it sometimes has maybe an interesting a moral truth, something that we can tell our kids, you know, don't do it because this is, this is a, tr uh, a purpose or a belief behind it. Uh, but a lot of times, the idea between these stories is they're just fun. So at least the way we would view them or interpret them, they're fun little stories that really don't have as much moral truth to them, but maybe they're just um, like Ace of Fable, something that we can learn something from. But they, they, a lot of these uh, people in some cultures, some ways of looking at it that reject the Bible, they have to have purpose and existence in something. And a lot of times they find it in these stories and in these things that have been told for thousands of years. They find purpose and meanings and have something to base their view on some of these different stories. And these are just a, a sampling of stories. Uh, so really, what does the Bible say? Well, storytelling communicates. 
Uh, Jesus Christ used a lot in his parables stories. He would go about and he told things that weren't true stories, but the parables, they were they're fictional creator stories of the Good Samaritan, the wise, uh, the wise men built this house on the rock, the prodigal sons, things that probably never really happened, but he was telling these stories, these examples that people could visualize and they could think through and have something communicated, some moral truth that he was teaching about these things. He also used examples like the fig tree uh, and other things, the, the mustard seed that he would see, and he would be able to point visualizations to things as he saw, uh, saw, saw them in his preaching and his teaching of the disciples and the people that he came in contact with. So storytelling is powerful. And there is a purpose behind it because we remember things through storytelling. We can visualize these things and we can remember the, the purpose behind them and there is, is a good purpose behind it. Uh, leading into storytelling actually leads me just to kind of a little commercial here, uh, but really talking about uh, what I did in my thesis project was helping with this class and really dialoguing with people was Dust to Life, the Visual Gospel. It's actually the picture of 19 different pictures that portray the gospel, what it might be like from Genesis to Revelation, in a very personal way, partially because I'm the one who's actually um, acting or, or playing the role in these parts. It's the self-portrait. But the uh, project was not about me. It was really about the gospel. And I was always around, so due to deadlines, I didn't have to worry about my brothers or teachers or other people I had to work with their schedule. So it worked out well for me in that way. Um, but here, the idea, what would it be like to be created from dust? What would it have been like to have been Adam? Great from the dirt, uh, from the dirt, and created as the first man. Um, so interesting story. To lust, uh, going to this, the fall of man, the different ways maybe people have sinful choices. The, the lust of the eyes, the uh, pride of life. Uh, here, the root of money is the uh, root of all evil. Uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. And the idea here that uh, this person here, and there's a lot of symbolism put in these pictures that communicates something. Um, he's religious, uh, but he's lost. And this idea, this man is, is not knowing the true uh, way to heaven. Other way people might sin, uh, this one was actually very contemporary. The idea of uh, transgenderism and some of the aspects of today's culture, Bruce or Caitlyn Jenner. The idea of what it, why is it wrong? Well, the scripture says, why should the thing say to him that formed it? Why have you made me thus? Why should we reply against the creator? Uh, so a powerful piece. And I've had ways of dialogue with people who believed, did not, uh, did not accept the, uh, the scripture's teachings on some of these topics and be able to confront them with some of the truths of the scriptures based in a visual way. Uh, the pride of life, the selfie generation, uh, it, it's prevalent in a lot of our culture. Being prideful uh, in ways to um, reject maybe or, or as, the, as a sinful way of, of the sin of pride. Uh, to my sins, your sins murdered Christ on the cross. He died for my sins, he died for your sins. And we're, uh, our sins are, are personally a way of kind of visualizing my sins, my rejection of Christ. Is what put him on the cross, partially what put him on the cross. One, one person's sin. Uh, to the fear of man, what it's like to be dangling. This one kind of inspired from uh, the sermon, the uh, sinner in the hands of an angry God, like a spider dangling in front of hell. That, that fear that could help someone to maybe see and to visualize some of the, the temptation or the fear of the eternal separation from God in hell. To uh, the gift of God is eternal life. It's not through works, it's not through coming to church, it's not through being a good person, but through that special gift, that symbolic picture of the gift here, an actual package, but the gift that's even talked in Ephesians 2. Uh, to then being washed, uh, having your sins washed as snow or as wool, or this is an example of milk, uh, but it happens to be white and pure, that purity statement over the white and the dark contrast and symbolism. Um, to even being once you're saved, once uh, I'm saved, or we're born again, we have a message to share with the world. In a dark world, as we are now a light in the world, being a bold witness, where I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and his salvation to everyone that believes. Uh, so that was some of the inspiration behind this one. I had different scripture passages in mind when I come up with these ideas, and I would share them uh, that were used uh, specifically to kind of put this part of the gospel together, this part of how it works out in, in a believer's life. Uh, and the idea here of anthropology, studying mankind as the flower of the grass withers, uh, the, the flower fades, the grass withers, um, but the word of our God stands forever. This is the kind of inspiration behind this one. Is that it won't last very long. Just like our, our earthly uh, frail bodies won't last very long. Um, some of that aspect. This one is actually one of, one of my favorites in putting together. Would I sacrifice my son or my daughter for the sins of the world? I don't think I would. I, I couldn't. As I wrestled through this one, as I, as I played the role, uh, it, it was became very real to me as I realized, no, I, I couldn't do that. I don't think I could do that. Uh, and the idea here inspired from what Abraham's test with Abraham and Isaac. And if it was up to me, if, if it was my decision, 
everybody else would be lost, I'd be lost. Uh, I couldn't do that. And so, so powerful uh, reminder of that truth. Once we're saved, we still do things we shouldn't, either maybe watch things we shouldn't, listen to things we shouldn't, maybe just something that wastes our time, neglects the Bible for something that's irrelevant, something that's not important. Uh, so this one can be powerful and taken a little bit different way, a different interpretation. Uh, this one, the idea is uh, being called, uh, called, and maybe it's out in creation, but the idea that God knows the number of the stars. He knows everyone's name. But still, he knows me. He cares about the sparrows. And so in that little person amongst this huge universe, he still cares for me. And that can be inspiring and something to live for. It gives us purpose and hope uh, in the God that we serve. And the idea here of a kind of taking, it was more of a contemporary project. And so visualizing the sword of Hebrews 4.12, instead of making it an older version of a sword, which today is not the most important weapon out there, um, but the gun, making a contemporary, and that gun is out there too quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged gun. Uh, or how if you want to put that together. So the, the kind of modernized the version, but then also the idea of parenting, raising your children uh, in the way of righteousness, fending off the evil with, with the sword, teaching, teaching them yes, but also to know the way of righteousness, the way, the way of life, and kind of visualizing that in a different little interpretation, a different way. Uh, and this one uh, also, I think, is one of my favorites, one of the more powerful ones, the idea of once we're saved, once we've been taken from the flames of hell and rescued, like the fear image, we now go back to that. We, we reach into the flames to rescue our neighbors, our family, others who don't know the truth, who don't accept the truth. So knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, hence the name terror. Um, and also this one is on turn, is what I named it, turning uh, even as a nation, obviously the plague symbol in a lot of the United States, uh, but the idea there's the capital in the background, and the idea of um, repenting of our sins as a nation, and all the, all the things that we do as a nation, and turning back to God. It, it's an Old Testament passage, but it does talk about that, and that's the inspiration behind it. Uh, and then the idea of Maranatha, lo we comest, and the idea that we all we should be looking for uh, the Savior's return, looking to the skies, and, and looking for that moment, whenever that would be, that he comes back. And then what would it be like to be resurrected from the dead? I don't know. It hasn't happened to me yet. But what that could like, look like in our lives, I don't know. Uh, and trying to in visualize what that could be and maybe to uh, interpret that. I know I've had uh, several people, they, they first see the picture, they put it on their, uh, in, in their house, and they've had people come and, what about it? And they've had chances to share the gospel with people and say, this is, this is what I believe, that someday my body uh, will be resurrected. And so it, it has made people think and stop, which is what art does in a lot of ways. Uh, then the last picture is what I call crown, the idea of uh, looking for the crown of life, uh, looking forward to what uh, someday, what it may be like uh, to be before the throne of God uh, and to visualize as we lay down our crowns at Jesus' feet at the end of life. So from creation to all our sins to being uh, definitely guilty as a murderer of Christ, our sins are, are, are condemning us and sending us to hell, to being resurrected uh, and then one day forgiven and even at uh, God's, God's throne one day. So that is the gospel in pictures, 19 of them. Um, and so to move on into more of the, the message and different things I had prepared, what is life's purpose? And the idea we all have a purpose, whether, whether we know it or not or we don't live for it. But if you turn to Genesis 1, 26 through 31, that's one of the uh, passages I want to turn and look at. Probably pretty familiar with you for the most part, but while you're turning uh, to your Bible, Genesis 1, 26 to 31, maybe it's on a smartphone device if you want. You could uh, pull up the site, uh, and you could actually, there's a social media button. You could share the gospel uh, in pictures, if you so choose. Um, I don't think anybody cares. Pastors aren't upset if you're on Facebook during church. Uh, but you're welcome if you have your phones out. You can go to that site. It's on your uh, prayer sheet as well. And you can actually put it out uh, there. Like, a comment on a picture, share a picture if you so choose. And uh, be able to share the, uh, with your neighbors, with your friends in a different way. So anyway, Genesis 1, uh, in looking at that passage there, it talks about, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree, and uh, the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. 
and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given you every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning was the sixth day. So based on scripture, what we believe, we were created, as I think we all know, from the dust of the earth, and we had a purpose, we had a, a uh, reason to exist. Why? To take care of the earth, to subdue it, to replenish it, to, to, to take care of it, which is, which is an important responsibility. Which taking care of the earth is also what a lot of people believe that aren't believers nowadays. That is the big push, some of the eco-friendly movements, and we'll get into that as we progress through some of the uh, different things that I have. But also going back to the first slide about myth, I talk about these myths, these stories, these cultural identities, whether you're a Christian or you've got some, maybe some Greek ancestrals or some Roman beliefs or things that you believe, however you base your worldview on. Uh, a lot of these stories, myths, um, some people will think, and, and I would believe there is a source, that there is actually one true source. And Val Vladimir Prop went through, and I didn't read the entire book and all his research, but in a lot of his research, he wanted to try to decide what is the true way? What is the one story that is told for generations uh, where does it base them? Is there actually one truth, or is there just lots of things that are kind of similar to each other with really no connection to them? And so, so we talk about the herb myth. Uh, well, uh, the great deceiver, if we look at uh, John chapter 8, 44, Jesus is dialoguing with the Pharisees, and he calls them uh, that they are of their father, the devil, the father of lies. Uh, and it's and it quite, quite a debate as he's sitting there talking to the Pharisees. And so Jesus has treated uh, the, uh, or is talking that the deceiver, the great deceiver, Satan, uh, which is walking about as a lion, seeking to whom he may devour, is out there. And so, an interesting quote uh, from A.W. Tozer, I found also that wrong ideas about God, just sometimes very little ones, just little, little deceitfulness that God, Satan will put out there, are the only foundation from which the polluted waters of idolatry flow. Sometimes they themselves are idolatrous. And so these, these little twists, these little things that Satan can throw out there, deceive, can become, trip people up to lead them astray, to, to neglect the truth of God's word, uh, and to follow something that is, that is false. And, and the Satan has been doing that for thousands of years, and he's very good at it. So the idea of creation from dust is actually not a, a creation, or is not actually an idea that's exclusive to Genesis in the Bible. Uh, some Aborigines cultures, some of their myths and stories of Aborigines talk about kangaroos jumping from the rocks, and then all of a sudden these gods become kangaroos and jump around in the dirt. There's a dirt creation connection in there. Um, some cultures talk about uh, dust in, in man. Greek culture, which we're going to study Greek culture, is most of what I studied for this message. Uh, Greek culture has that the gods came from the rocks. They sprung up from the rocks, the, the ground, the earth, somehow. They don't know how either, uh, but that's, that's their basis, that they have some connection to creation, which is similar to the Genesis account. It has a lot of similarities, and a lot of cultures have similarities to some of these different things as I've studied them. The ancient Greeks. So what are some similarities between what we believe and the ancient Greeks' beliefs. Some of their myths, some of their stories, their, their way of existence uh, has some of these different areas. They have uh, Zeus. Some, most of you are probably even familiar with Zeus, uh, the, the god Zeus. And a lot of the gods, I should say, are more, uh, they're kind of people that have been deified. They, they hold them as higher than people. They're maybe almost like saints in a Catholic church. Sometimes they try to deify or make this person more important than he really was. But they've taken Zeus, and he, he, they, there's a lot of connections. They think he probably was uh, based on Adam, according to some of, some of the biblical research, a lot of different ways that were very similar to what they talk about Zeus and being kind of the first, the first person or the first god in the Greek culture. Hera, Hera has an interesting connection, a lot of similarities to add, the, the biblical Eve, so the first man, the first woman, the connections to uh, what we have as a, as a, as a mankind or in their a creation of gods, uh, one man or one woman, aspect. They also have a Garden of Eden, or something similar to Eden. They have a, a, a different name for it, but it's the same idea of paradise, amazing creation, where these gods, uh, Hera and Zeus, lived in for a period of time, which has a striking similarity to Genesis' account. Uh, they also have um, the idea here of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's in their accounts, that's in the scripture, which they talked about and eventually written down generations later. They have a serpent. And they have a fruit called an apple, which this is actually where a lot of, sometimes we think Christianity, we call the apple is the fruit, uh, the forbidden fruit. This is where it comes from, actually from a lot of the Greek cultures and the Greek stories. Uh, so a lot of similarities, whether it was an apple or whatever, we don't know, it doesn't matter. But a lot of similarities through the story. But this is where the great deceiver comes in. He puts a little bit of falseness into something. It's a little bit of lies in some of these stories 
that now become a, a, a great difference. Um, so once the fruit was eaten, Zeus and, and Hera eat the fruit, they've taken the fruit, and now it is actually glorified in Greek culture as something that's very good. And in the biblical account, is actually something that's is very uh, disdained and very evil. And that casts us all into sin, into the curse of sin because of it. So what actually happened when uh, the uh, fruit was eaten by Hera and Zeus is Atlas, which was another god, where it came from, I don't know, uh, in, in their belief system. But Atlas basically takes the earth or the gods on the earth and he separates them. He puts them on his back and he moves them into heaven, which is the idea here that gods are now separated from mankind. So now there is something apart from them. Uh, which in this picture, this is on a Greek base, some of the Greek art bases that they have. The serpent actually shows up as part of there that's reaching up to heaven, kind of ruling over earth, is the idea, taking over mankind. Some striking similarities now, the, the serpent in a lot of Greek culture is glorified, deified, and very important in their aspects of beliefs, which has similarities to the serpent that is in Genesis, the, the serpent uh, was evil, was, was, was Satan. So uh, Genesis 3.15, our account, uh, says that there's enmity, there's a curse of sin between Adam and Eve and the serpent. And it's not looked at as a good thing, it is it's a bad thing. So his, this is the big difference in terms of the stories, but they start to have the, uh, the deceit or the differences in the story matter. Um, so we have uh, also sons that were born to Zeus in a Hera. And uh, they have one uh, son here that's name is Ares. Uh, according to the Greek uh, stories, the myths, what they have... Uh, Arius was very worthless, he was hateful, he was a renegade, uh, the bane of all mortals, as Homer wrote and put down. Uh, he wasn't looked upon very well. They also had a second son that was, I don't even know how you pronounce it, I've read a lot of these names, Hephaestus, something like that. Uh, but Hephaestus was banished, forged, uh, and wandered the earth as a vagabond for much of his life. Sound familiar? In the idea, though, in this story, instead of being Cain, he comes back to the truth. He already, in his sense, he's glorified as he comes back to Zeus. He comes back to his father. They're, they're, uh, uh, they're making a peace with each other. Now, uh, Hephaestus has now become the glorified person, the one, the, the way of good, according to the Greek culture, the, the, the good line of mankind uh, comes through Hephaestus. So similarities, in a lot of ways, except they reject Seth. The Seth being the one who the, the line of Christ came through. A lot of the good things, uh, that uh, the, the good line of mankind came through, or the uh, line of Seth was more the, the line that Jesus came through. So there's a difference there. They reject Seth. Actually, the line of Cain is, is told to, to, to uh, destroy and to tear down the line of Seth for being evil. And that's a huge difference according to what the scripture teaches and what we learn in the scriptures. Uh, they also have, in a lot of cultures, and the Greek culture, uh, one of them as well, has a cataclysmic flood. Some type of a worldwide or enormous flood. I wonder where they get that from. Uh, and the idea is it wipes out the line of Cain or the line of uh, Hephaestus. Uh, and so some stories have actually been wiped out, destroyed, dead. Some have it that Minotaurs, maybe more uh, fairy tale like Minotaurs stomped on him until he was almost dead. But anyways, there's a cataclysmic flood, or sometimes a cataclysmic event, that prevented Cain from reigning, whether he died or whether he almost died, depending on the Greek stories that you believe, or the ones you actually take as true. But the idea here is, though, is once Cain was dead, the line that was supposed to be maintained was Cain. So they had to do something with Cain. So in the stories, in the myths, that Cain is actually, there's a rebirthing of Hera, the first woman, Eve. Hera is rebirthed, or, or born again, resurrected from the dead, which is interesting, the idea of resurrecting something. But in a false way here, the goddess of Athena. The goddess Athena is now resurrected, and she is now glorified, or, or been the one to worship, the one that is important to the Greek culture. Um, so the word is Athena comes from. The word Athena comes from some of the Greek terms, uh, thanatos, which means death and with the A meaning deathlessness. Athena, as we pronounce it, deathlessness. So having victory over death, that's the idea for the goddess Athena. Uh, as you can see from the picture there, um, there's actually a little apple just above her, above her chest. There's a little apple in her mouth, which symbolizes back to the glorifying of eating the fruit, rejecting God uh, that we see in the story of their similar Garden of Eden. Um, and some of the little symbolic portions that we see through the stories, which are, I think, quite fascinating as, as I research them, as I do dialogue with people that didn't believe the scriptures. Also on this statue, that which is put um, in the Pantheon, I believe, there's a little, or actually a fairly large, serpent, which serpent is very glorified as kind of the, the mascot or the, the workings of a goddess Athena. is glorified in a way, which, of course, goes against the Genesis account as the serpent has been condemned uh, and, and not one that is to be worshipped, but is... is representing the, the Satan, the great deceiver. So an interesting connection there. 
Uh, so we see, kind of stepping back and looking at the differences in, in review, Adam and Eve, according to the biblical worldview, we have eating the fruit. Uh, he brought sin uh, and death into a perfect creation. We're all cast into sin, and we still see the curse of sin every day and, and through what we see today. The Greek beliefs, they have Zeus and Hera, the first man and woman, and what they came up with is the idea of eating the fruit uh, as glorified mankind as dismissing the gods from mankind. We don't have to have the gods in our world anymore because we're separated from them. We're, we're better than that. We don't want them in our life. We've pushed God out, or gods, God, gods, however many they have, pushing them out of our life. We want to do our own thing. Rejection, rebellion of the way of God is really how, was, how I, I view it. And a lot of the New Age culture, especially in the 60s and 70s, uh, started to pick up on some of these same philosophies and things that have been around for thousands of years. The idea of earth is given to man. That's, that's what we believe. God gave us dominion to, to rule, to take care of, and, and to subdue the earth. That's what we see in Genesis 1 that we already looked at. Uh, and we're worshiping God the Father. The idea is to have a relationship with God healed uh, through, through our salvation, through a gift, not through works, and that we can have that gift of salvation and have a, a relationship with God the Father, the creator of the universe. Uh, a lot of the New Age, a lot of the Greek culture believes in, of course, that paganism has freed uh, mankind uh, from religion. We don't have to have God in our world anymore. They can rationalize it away as best they can. It, he's, it, he's ancient. He's just a myth. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference in our life. How, how do we know that? And a lot of times, this is brought back to the great goddess. Sometimes maybe it's great goddess Athena. A lot of times in, the, in the, uh, some of the cultures, the paganisms, the Wiccan, some of the witchcraft areas, is actually looking at the great goddess Mother Nature and, and the worshiping Mother Earth, Mother Nature. If you watch the weather anytime soon, you'll hear Mother Nature Pretty much every time you watch the news, so how Mother Nature this and Mother Nature that. I don't think there's always, they necessarily know the connection, but there is some connections of how they're worshiping Mother Earth or the great goddess Mother Earth. And a lot of times these ancient myths are a way to try to neglect, reject the truth of the scripture, the creation account, their own similar versions uh, in, in a lot of ways. Um, there's a quote here, I won't read the entire quote, and for sake of time, we're getting a little bit less in time, but this this uh, atheist here uh, that actually had He's one of these avowed paganists. I haven't read all of work, but I read some of it in my research as I dialogue with my classmates. And he uh, was very much in, in praising Earth Day and how uh, Earth Day was a glorified thing and how wonderful it was. And really looking back to the paganism or rejecting God, may, maybe there's a, a, a higher power, but really Mother Earth, worshiping Mother Earth is important. And it's the summary of what we see in a lot of his writings and his work. Um, so one of the, the pagans, uh, not necessarily Wiccan, but some of those uh, pagan ideas put out there. So what is the biblical response? We've looked at a lot of the creation uh, and even the Greek ideas here and the differences, but what is the, the, uh, the way to look at it scripturally? Well, Romans 1, uh, 20 through 25, uh, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And we see this through Greek culture, similars, and Roman culture, and a lot of cultures, mythologies for thousands of years that have taken parts of truth and has been twisted in the minds of the great deceiver to be a lie, and it has led people astray. Going on in the passage, and so taking that, that wonderful wisdom, their, their mankind's wisdom, and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like unto corruptible men, into the birds, into four-footed beasts, into creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to vile affections, through the lust of their own heart, to those of those own, uh, to dishonor their bodies between themselves, uh, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worship and serve the creature, who is, and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So uh, another passage I also want to take a look at briefly, and I have them all up here, so you don't have to return to them. Uh, is Acts 17, and the Acts 17 is actually the uh, sermon that Paul preached in Mars Hills. He was in front of uh, Athenians, Greek philosophers, some of the great minds of the Greek times, which we just looked at Greek culture. And so he comes across these huge bodies, and all they want to do, according to the passage, if you read in Acts 17, is they want to know of new some. They want to know of everything new. They want new ideas. They want new enlightenment. They just want to know of something new. So Paul presents to them something new, and he says that God that made the world and all things therein seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temple made with hands. He neither is he worshipped with men's hands, nor is, that, nor is that he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath in all things. And he has made one of one blood all nations uh, of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed 
in the bounds of their habitation. That they should seek the Lord, if they happily might feel after him and find him, though he be not far away from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And as certain, also of our own poets, looking at a lot of these Greek and the, these philosophers that were writing things, Homer, Plato, have said, for we are of his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we are not to think that Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by man's devices. It's not something we can create. And at times of this ignorance, the God winked at, but God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That's the call. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man which he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and in that he has raised him from the dead. So that's the scriptural approach of God through scripture from generations, from, from Genesis all the way through Revelation, has revealed himself. He, he's, he's made himself clear. And there's a lot of parts of truth that are through cultures that we see through the flood and through creation account that people reject based on the great deceiver twisting the words uh, and, and leading people astray based on some of these myths and things that people believe. So we really have a choice. We have the choice to serve God the Father or Mother Earth, the great goddess Athena, whatever we want our dialogue. And a lot of times it's represented maybe as the goddess Athena, but we have other things that we worship as well. But two choices, worshiping God or worshiping a false god, whatever that happens to be, Mother Earth, Mother Nature, goddess Athena. So it reminds me in conclusion, as I look at maybe the end of life, um, what is the hope, what is the purpose for life? And I look at what uh, Joshua said when he was actually getting ready to go into uh, the new land to take over God's promised land, go across the Jordan, conquer a very pagan set of people. That God said, go and destroy them. They're out there you know, sacrificing their babies to idols, burning them, and doing all kinds of uh, rejection, rebellious acts to God. And what does he say to the people? You have a choice to make. And I think this is a very familiar verse, but I'll read it as we close. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But it's for me, and for my house, we will serve the Lord. So we're left with a choice, to serve the Lord, or to serve the gods, or the creator, the imagined, the mythical gods, or the purposes of mankind and the deceivers.